I read with you 2 Timothy 1. Paul's letter to Timothy, the second, uh, second letter in chapter 1. Hear the word of God. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, according to the promise of life which is in Christ Jesus, grace and mercy and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord, I thank God whom I serve with a pure conscience, as my forefathers did, as without ceasing I remember you in my prayers night and day, greatly desiring to see you, being mindful of your tears, that I may be filled with joy. When I call to remembrance the genuine faith that is in you, which first dwelt in your grandmother, Louis, and your mother, Eunice, and I am persuaded, is in you also. Therefore, I remind you to stir up the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For God has given us, not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind or self-control. Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, but share with me in the sufferings for the gospel according to the power of God, who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace which was given us in Christ Jesus before time began, but has now been revealed by the appearing of our Savior Christ, Jesus Christ, who has abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel, to which I was appointed a preacher, an apostle, and a teacher of the Gentiles. For this reason I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed, and I am persuaded that he is able to keep what I have committed to him until that day. Hold fast the pattern of sound words which you have heard from me, in faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. That good, that good thing which was committed to you, keep by the Holy Spirit who dwells in us. This you know, that all those in Asia have turned away from me, among whom are Phygelus and Hermogenes. The Lord grant mercy to the household of Onesiphorus, for he often refreshed me and was not ashamed of my chain. But when he arrived in Rome, he sought me out very zealously and found me. The Lord grant to him that he may find mercy from the Lord in that day. And you know very well how many ways, in how many ways he ministered to me at Ephesus. This is the word of the living God. <clears throat> now, this morning I, I'm, I'm going to do something different. I'm not going to preach an exegetical sermon but call it a teaching sermon from uh, uh, this chapter of Paul, um, looking at the, at the question uh, or, 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 or at the theme, what are the main reasons for being a Christian? At least from my perspective, as uh, I have known the Lord for over 38 years, seven reasons for being a Christian. And the reason why I deal with this topic is if we are aware that what's going on in the world, especially here in North America, we hear, if you are young, now and then, so-and-so, some so-called worship leader has left the faith, or so-and-so has left the faith, or so-and-so is not believing in God anymore. And you are troubled when you hear that. Well, let me tell you, my phone is in my car. I have lots of messages from my friend in Uganda. So-and-so has come over from Islam, and so-and-so has come over, and so-and-so, and I'm protecting them. I've rescued them from their persecutors. It's just the opposite over there. So be encouraged by that. Nonetheless, let us consider this. Why should we never, in a million years, consider Drifting away. I am thinking of our young people. How can I motivate you to run the race till the end? I want to give you seven reasons why it is unthinkable to ever throw in the towel, to give up. 
Seven reasons. If I look back on God's grace in my own life, what I cannot imagine ever giving up. Paul says in 2 Timothy 1.12, I know in whom I have believed. That's a firm statement. I know in whom I have believed. For I know that he, I am persuaded that he is able to keep, to keep that which I've committed to him until that day. To keep my life, my soul, my everything until that day when he appears. I know in whom I have believed. Okay, so seven reasons why I, and I include every one of you in that, seven reasons why I am a Christian. Number seven is the honesty of God. If you look around you and listen to all the voices, you will know that we live at a, in a time of great deception. It is everywhere. It is in politics. It is in religion. It is in business. Wherever you go. Just study the religion of peace and see how much peace you find in that so-called religion of peace. Or, what will you learn about love in the love shop? Nothing. That is... The deception of our age. It is everywhere. But when you come to the Bible, you find that it is blank honest. Here is Paul. He says of himself in 1 Timothy, the previous letter, chapter 1, verse 12 through 13. I thank Christ Jesus, our Lord, who has enabled me because I because he counted me faithful, putting me into this ministry, although I was formerly a blasphemer, a persecutor, and an insolent man, that I obtained mer mercy. Do you, do you hear how he's speaking of himself? A blasphemer, a persecutor, a rude guy. Do you hear the honesty? There is one thing about the gospel, and it is that it makes us honest. The woman at the well who met Jesus there in Samaria, she went back to town and said, here is a man that told me everything I ever did. Hezekiah cried out to God in the midst of their crisis, the king, and says, we have sinned. All of us have sinned. Our leaders have sinned. Our fathers have sinned. Where do you hear that? It's even scarce in the church to hear that language. I have sinned. That is what the gospel does. This passion for honesty permeates everything in the Bible. Listen again to Paul. We're reading from his letter this morning. But 2 Corinthians 4. Paul says... We have renounced disgraceful and underhanded ways. We refuse to practice cunning or to tamper with God's word. But by open statement of the truth, we commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of God. We have renounced every trick and underhanded way, every form of cunning and deceit. What happens when they knock on your door? You know? Some cult. And they say, well, we believe in the same God. We're also Christians. But of course, in the back pocket, they have a secret. They want you to come along so that they can tell you. But they actually have another agenda. So they begin their whole campaign with deception. That's how they operate. It's everywhere. But in the Bible, there's no surprises. This is huge. And you know where it comes from. It comes from the very character of God. The very God we worship. The Lord Jesus says in John 10, 
uh, that amazing chapter in the Bible. He says, most assuredly I tell you, he who does not enter, uh, or rather, I should go, uh, he who does not enter by the sheepfold by the door, but climbs in some other way, is a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the doorkeeper opens, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name, and he leads them out. Every word is important here. Jesus didn't climb over the fence like false prophets. You study them, how they climb over the fence, how they deceive people. He presented himself openly. This is who I am. Take it or leave it. And he calls his sheep. That means persuasion. In the earliest Christian documents, it says the gospel comes by persuasion. There is no compulsion in the gospel. Nobody is forced. God persuades us. He leads his sheep because they're convinced of the truth. Here is a quote of one of my favorite professors, Jacob van Bruggen. The gospel comes from God and seeks to convince us, not the other way around. We don't convince God by our works. He comes to us seeking to convince us by the truth. Here is one you can trust. He presents himself at the sheepfold. You know, Jesus is the worst salesman ever. He tells you from the word go, if you want to follow me, take up your cross. Are you going to suffer for me? You find that in other uh, religions or whatever you have, philosophies? Come along. But I tell you, the foxes have holes and the birds of nests and the son of man has no place to lay down his head. You still want to follow? And yet, that is why you can stake your life on him. He will not lie to you. This is the shepherd that lies down, lays down his life for the sheep. That is the first reason that I love the Lord. His absolute honesty. Here is a man that told me everything I ever did. We need that. Second one. Reason number six. Our God is real. Not only honest. Blank honest, but real. We're, writing, we're reading from Paul's letter to Timothy. You know there was something rock solid underneath everything that Paul did and preached and suffered for. You know what was that? His real life encounters with the risen Jesus. Though God knew Paul from the day he was born, formed in his mother's womb, he had a real life encounter with the risen Jesus on the Damascus Road and many others subsequent to that, by the way. So real that Luke told that story of Paul's conversion three times over in Acts and it's again repeated in Galatians from Paul's own uh, in Paul's own, wor uh, own words. When Paul says that, that, that God saved us and called us with a holy calling, then in all due respect, Paul is not talking about religion. He's not talking even about theology. Paul did not read the sin books. He met the living Christ. And that is, by the way, why we have good theology. He did not read this in books. His God is real. Nothing was more real to him than the risen Jesus. Now, mind you, I have not seen the, the risen Jesus with my naked eye. But I can tell you, and I think, I'm sure so can you that the Lord has revealed to him me in ways larger than life. I remember way back when I came to faith in the 80s and again through my deepest trials 
I, I know. I could, I could sooner deny the existence of my father and mother than the Lord. There's a greater chance that they are not real than that he is not real. What he did in my life can never be reduced to coincidence or my own fancies or fantasies. And no skeptical professor will ever convince me of that either. I could go down memory lane and, 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 and recall what the Lord did. Like Jacob when he woke up the next morning. And he said, truly, this is the house of God. He was running away from his brother and then he slept at that, laid his head down on a stone. And the next morning he said, well, God was, was here. He met with me. For you see, my dear friends, there are times when God's realm and our realm intersect and overlap. That is what worship is all about. That's why you should never neglect your devotions. There are times and places where the two overlap and touch. Go and think and meditate on these things and you will recognize them. And one day, heaven will finally come down to earth after they have been separated long ago in the beginning. And so, doesn't matter, that, that doesn't matter that you did not have a dramatic conversion encounter. No. But do you truly believe in the Lord Jesus and that you are saved by His grace alone? Just begin with the ordinary. Look around you at creation. You know, Atheist scientists find the fine-tuning of, of the universe as the most compelling argument. They don't want to listen to the Bible. The most compelling argument that there must be a God. If you truly, if you put your phone away and everything else and begin to think about it, you will realize, like Jacob, that he lives. Truly, he is an amazing God. I don't expect you, young brother and sister, to devote yourself to a religion, but only to a living, personal, infinite God, who is the same yesterday, today, and forever, and who sent His Son into this world to save sinners like you and me. That is the second, or number six, why I am a Christian. The reality of God. You know, I study Islam quite a bit. And when I compare the Bible, there is simply no comparison. The Bible is full of place names, persons' names. Eyewitness testimony. What does it tell you? He was here. He was with us. You read the books of other religions. You can sense it from the first paragraph. It was made up by man. It doesn't touch the ground. Or when he does in evil ways. But now reason number five is this. The power of the gospel. And it is closely connected to the former. The apostle Paul says. He cannot stop speaking about the gospel. The gospel is mentioned a, ho a whole number of times here in the first chapter of Second Timothy. And you remember how he opened his letter to the church in Rome. For the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. For the gospel, Paul said to, uh, in one of his trials, he says, this gospel that Jesus gave to me is the means by which he transfers people from darkness to light and from death to life. Can you imagine that? What, what a wonderful and an amazing power that is to transform people, transfer them from darkness darkness to light and death to life. It is a power we cannot imagine. And therefore, I'm not surprised when I hear and read and see the testimonies today, more than before, of 
whoever, atheists, very wicked people, Jews, Muslims, and they come to faith and they are changed. And also people in the church radically changed by the good news. Because it is the power of God unto salvation. Doesn't matter who you are. Doesn't matter how great your guilt may have been and your shame. Doesn't matter how deep your sorrow is. Doesn't matter how gloomy the shadows in your life are. There is resurrection power in Jesus. And you can say he came into my life and he changed. I became a new being. A new creation. The old things have passed away. They have all become new. Ever heard this testimony of Dr. James Tour, one of the top scientists in the world, Jewish man? How the Lord changed him a couple of decades ago. How he knew that Jesus was with him there in his room, where as a Jew brought up in Judaism, he never would believe. This is the power of the gospel. All because of that man who died on the cross and rose victoriously, the son of David. And please take this from me today. The power of the gospel is not only what it takes away from us, our guilt and shame and fear of death. Praise God for that. The power is also in what it gives to you. And then I'm not thinking even of eternal life, which begins now, by the way, which is wonderful. But you know, Paul, speaking to Timothy here in 2 Timothy, speaks of something else that has been neglected too much. What he gives to us when he takes away our condemned existence and changes us. He gives us a new holy calling, a new destiny in life. To put it in Athanasius' words, God eternal shared in our miserable fallen humanity by walking among us and dying on the cross and rising. Why? So that we may share already now in His divinity. In His divine life is poured out into us. The early fathers believed that and I do as well. Not simply sins forgiven, justified, all of that is true. But God makes us share in His divine life. That is what Paul means, that you are heirs of God and co-heirs of Christ and the Spirit witnesses in your heart that you are sons of the living God. He gives us a new calling here now. And it extends into eternity. And there's no other name that can do that but the name of Jesus. There's no other one that will satisfy you but Him. And therefore, Augustine said, our souls remain restless until they find rest in Him. Sometimes you hear of a Christian that has backslidden and then goes through the world of experience and religion and uh, sin and debauchery and eventually like a thirsty dog and a guilty dog comes back to its master. Why? We well, you know you've tasted the living water. There is nothing compared with it. Absolutely nothing. Once you have tasted it, You know nothing else can satisfy. But let us then remember what is the gospel. Our Lord Jesus said, And so the Son of Man had to suffer many things and be crucified and enter into His glory so that repentance, that is turning around, repentance may be proclaimed in His name and the forgiveness of sins. In Jerusalem, Judea, and all the world. So that is reason number five. The power of the gospel. And now number four. Why I'm a Christian is the incredible reach of the Christian message.
You remember when the new administration started in the U.S.? Was it January this year? You know what the first thing was that they did? The 117th Congress of the United States. They made a new rule. It kind of went by unnoticed. They made a new rule that no longer may you refer to your father or mother or brother or sister or you know, uncle or aunt in this house. And then someone prayed and he prayed in the name of all the many gods and he closed the prayer with amen and women." You remember that? And they thought they were so smart. But do you know what really happened? The whole world was laughing. The whole world. It was a complete puppet show. But that is what happens when people turn their back on the living God. They become the scorn of the world. Eventually, that is what happens not only to countries and powerful nations, but to families and individuals. The reach of this gospel message into history is just incredible. History has proven it over and over. Nations or tribes turn to Jesus and eventually they are exalted. Nations or families turn away from him and eventually they are humiliated. I saw that in my own country. The, the, the church federation that I grew up in, I saw that in many others. You see that in art and culture. One good Christian author did that. He compared the music of J.S. Bach with um, the lead singer of Nirvana. I forgot his name, Cobain, I think. They both lost their parents at age nine. But the one served the living God and the other one was some kind of a Buddhist hippie. And you look at the culture they produced. The vast difference. So the truth in its impact on the world is unmistakable. But also not only in the world, in our own personal lives. The, the gospel turns you and me into healthy human beings. Paul wrote to Timothy these amazing words. Did you notice? He says, Greatly desiring to see you, being mindful of your tears, that I may be filled with joy. In one sentence, mindful of your tears. This is one man to another man, that I may be filled with joy. When I remember the genuine faith that is in you, that was first in your mother and grandmother, and then he reminds him of the gift of God and says, God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. What do you see here? You see the human being restored in the image of God. Oh, some cultures say you may not cry. It's not good for men to cry. Other says don't show too much joy, you know. Just keep your emotions nicely in a box. Paul can speak to his son and says, I remember your tears. And, and, and what joy is it to, to know you? And, and he can speak of courage. Saul Shinitzen said, the, 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 the virtue mostly lacking in the West is courage. There's almost nothing left of it. But the gospel restores it. Healthy, God-given emotions. You see, our idol-shaped culture enslaves us and kills us emotionally. It distorts us in every way. There is no place for exuberant joy. You may never cry. By the way, you will not find a single tear in the Quran or a joyful song in the mosque. Do you know that? 
but you come to Christ and you find your emotions are liberated for His praise and His glory. The only thing you and I need to be ashamed of is our sin. And even that His blood can wash away. You see? Go study humanism. Go study whatever-ism, Marxism. See what it does to human beings. And then read your Bible and the beautiful stories in the Bible. And you will find that you become alive as a human being. That's reason number four. But number three is the core value. The core value. My young friend of Christianity is the third most important reason why I'm a Christian. We don't have time to go into detail. But you know, you see the beauty of something when you compare it with something else. The beauty of a diamond against a black cloth, right? So, In studying other faiths and religions and philosophies and ideologies, you see the beauty of Christianity. You can ask yourself, what is the core value of this ideology, of this religion? What it boils down to, at the heart of it, what does it come to? What is the core value? Now, what is the core value of Christianity? I can't go into the others. We don't have time for that. We heard it earlier. Whatever you want others to do unto you, you do unto them. And what you don't want them to do unto you, you don't do unto them. Love is the core value of Christianity. Some people reveal their stupidity by saying, oh, all religions are preaching it. It's absolute nonsense. They know nothing of these religions. Love was the signature hallmark of early Christianity. Let me give you one quick example. After Constantine came another emperor, Justinian the Apostate, who wanted to take the Roman Empire back into paganism. He was not happy with Christianity taking over. And he went into Cappadocia and other places and he said, He told the priests of the pagan priests, you know, how we shall do it is by caring for the poor and caring for the the downtrodden and the the needy in society like these Christians do. I have a quote from him here. This is what Justinian said. How apparent to everyone it is and how shameful that our own people lack support from us, that is the pagans, when no Jew ever has to beg, and the um, impious Galileans, marking them, support not only, the Galileans are Christians, that's how he called them, support not only their own poor, but ours as well. So he said the only way how we shall Conquer Christianity is by starting to showing love. But now the author of this book, Tom Holland, said that he did not realize that pagan religion cannot bring it forth and how deep it goes in Christianity. And so it was a complete failure. And on his tombstone, Justinian, or I, I, I believe it was written there, where he said, Oh, Galilean, referring to Jesus, you have conquered. You have conquered. We have nothing that can compare to what you have done to the world. Love is the greatest of all the commandments. When they put Jesus on the spot like no one was ever put on the spot, what? Tell us now. There are how many? 613 commandments in the Torah. What is the most important? You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind and your neighbor as yourself. 
Jesus told even a story that will stay with mankind until he comes. To drive it home, the story of the Good Samaritan. I believe it's even reflected somewhere in the building of the United Nations. Everywhere, when somebody does good to somebody, it, he's called a Samaritan. The words of Jesus are indelibly engraved in the conscience of humankind. And there is no religion, my young friends, that has anything compared to it. Nothing. You only care for your own. Like the tax collectors, they greet their own. That you will find, but not that you care for all. And even love your enemies. And so Nietzsche, he knew pretty well. Once we have killed the God of Christianity, where are we going to end up? In a dark, lonely, empty space. Ask not yourself why there is so much loneliness and depression and suicide. Ask not yourself. The answer is obvious. Now, if this is so simple, then I ask you, if you ever want to bid the gospel farewell, where do you go? Into this black hole that Nietzsche told you we will enter? Or where do you want to go? Where? There is nothing else there. I, I, I'm very honest with you. You can, you can bring me something in exchange for Christianity. That is better. I will take it right now. You cannot. There is nothing. Nothing even close that can be compared to this. And so the second reason, second most important, is the wonder of the message. We are now zooming in. Why am I a Christian? Why is exchanging the gospel for anything else uh, ridiculous? It is because of the unspeakable wonder of the core message of the Bible. From Genesis to Revelation... It's everywhere. Those who sat in darkness, a darkness that brought, they brought upon themselves, they saw a great light. That is the whole story of the Bible. We sat in darkness, but a great light has shone upon us and about us. God came into this world in spite of us. Listen to the Apostle Paul. I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who has given me strength even though I was a blasphemer, a persecutor, a violent man. I was shown mercy because I acted in ignorance and unbelief. The grace of our Lord Jesus was poured out on me abundantly. Not was poured out on me, but abundantly with faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. In the old translation, it says, exceedingly abundant. God's grace to me, a persecutor of the church, was exceedingly abundant. Grace is the message of Scripture. Superabundant grace. That's the only reason why sinners are saved and why there is hope for this world. Every other system of this world is based on your own merits and works. And so, in the Bible alone, will you find a God that has mercy on sinners. Have you ever read the Quran? From the very second surah, it's about war with the infidels. Killing them. For Allah hates them. I'm not exaggerating. And the God of the Bible, he says to Jonah, go to Nineveh. 
the most brutal people on the face of the earth that carried Israel away into captivity. Go there. Preach to them the gospel. And again, the Lord Jesus left us with a story so that it will be etched into our minds. The story of the prodigal son. So that we will never forget what grace is like. So if you want to leave Christianity, where will you go? John Stott called the grace of God the hound of heaven that will chase you until it finds you. Where will you go? How could I ever turn my back on, on such a God? And so we've heard so far, number seven, honesty, the honesty of God. Six, the reality of God. Five, the relevance and reach of the Bible's message. Four, the power of the gospel. Three, the core value of love. Two, the incredible message of grace. And now number one. What is, what is number one? You know it already. Jesus. Jesus is number one. God's grace appeared in Christ Jesus, says Paul, who abolished death and brought life and immortality to life through the gospel. It is a person. Thank God it is a person. You, you, you go read Acts 10 today. When Peter uh, explained the gospel to Cornelius, what did he talk about? Very complicated doctrines or maybe uh, rituals. No, no, no. He just explained what happened in these days in Judea and Galilee. That's what he explained. That is the gospel. Right? There once was a a Sikh holy man who was converted to Christianity and who became famous over a century ago, taking the gospel over the Himalayas to his own people. Again and again, he walked across the Himalayas. And then he was later, uh, he later went to the West and preached there and became a, a bit famous. And people in the West asked him, so what did you find? What philosophy? What teaching? What is it that you found that you became a Christian? He said, I fell in love with Jesus. With Jesus Christ, the Messiah. And that's why, let me remind you, one day our Lord Jesus, when everybody was raving about him still, the first part of his ministry, he took his disciples far away and he asked them, and you, my friends, what do you say about me? Who am I? What is your answer? You cannot escape this answer. Every one of you. Who am I? And what difference does it make to you? And you know Simon Peter's answer. He is the image of the invisible God. The exact imprint of his being. The radiance of his glory. The is full of grace and truth, the light of the world, the Lamb of God that took away the sins of the world, the Son of Mary and the Son of God, the Lion of Judah's tribe, the Son of David, the bright morning star, the Son of righteousness that rises with healing in its wings. He is the fairest of 10,000, the Rose of Sharon, the Lily of the fields, the Son of Man who is coming on the clouds, the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the resurrection and the life, our Savior and Lord, Lord, who holds the keys of death and Hades, the only righteous one among billions that ever lived, and the only risen man among all the corpses, God with us, Jesus Christ our Lord. Let it be known that you are his faithful follower like Paul. That you hold fast to the pattern of sound words 
which you have heard in the church through your upbringing. Hold on to that. And remember, my dear friend, God has not given us a spirit of fear in this day and age, but of power and of love and a sound mind. May the Lord bless you all. Amen. Come, let us pray. Lord our God, thank you that we could, gleaning from Paul, consider why we are Christians. And there are more reasons that we have not even touched on. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your love. Thank you for the hope of the gospel. I pray, Lord, that you will establish everyone here, older and younger, male and female, member and visitor, establish and root them in Christ Jesus and the truth of the gospel and of your word. For your glory's sake, here in Canada and wherever in the world,